Hello and welcome back to Seeds of Elegance. This is an interview series with change makers all around the world working on personal systems and social transformation. And today, my lucky guest is Heike Kemka. She's an intimacy coach originally from Germany, now living in Bali. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. All right, awesome. <laughs> and Heike, I would love to open the floor to, we'll go into the backstory because as you know, I love backstories, but I would love to know with how you define intimacy and who you like to support in your work as an intimacy coach. Hmm. Yeah, thank you, Libby. Thank you for having me here. And how do I define intimacy? Um, well, most people think of intimacy inside the bedroom, and I like to think of it inside the bedroom and outside the bedroom. And really um, being more intimate with yourself, with your partner, but also with life in general. And using every moment, every pleasure every pain as an opportunity to become more intimate with yourself with your feeling body with your thoughts with your emotions um but then coming back to my work and what i do i mostly do support women who want to go deeper on this journey of intimacy who want to reconnect with their pleasure um and really experience pleasure as a portal to who they truly are and maybe they feel disconnected from themselves or numb sometimes and it's like an area where there's so much conditioning shame and I'm really here to guide women with a gentle loving compassion um, into that area where they can explore themselves intimately. Mm. Thank you so much. And I want to get to kind of dive right in here. Um, not everyone who I interview here, I've gotten to speak with to, to a length of, for a length of time in advance. And for you and I, we did get to take some time before this and just open up your world a little. And I had a conversation this weekend. I just want to name since you're just mentioning all the offerings that you have. I want to paint just a small picture of some of the things that have been coming toward me as someone who's working with intimacy. In the last week alone, I have witnessed people talk about incredible shame that started from a high school age that has not been addressed more than a decade later that they wanted to bring to the surface. I've had someone on the on a polar opposite spectrum who has tons of lived experience by the world's standards of intimacy, who felt very distanced from themselves. I had someone who, after almost 20 years of marriage, witness that their own truth and their own needs were not being met in the way that they needed. And we had an in-depth conversation about how little attention is given in our lives as women around actually navigating that no and navigating our needs and navigating how to actually ask for those things. And I just wanna name for a moment that even today in the way that I'm coming to this call, it's with a level of uh, depth in my system, there's a spectrum here always, and there's so much joy that gets covered here. And we don't, uh, the people I invite here, we are not just here because of the joy, we're here because of every single part of the journey that led us here. And you are someone who has had a journey to get to this place of choosing to work on this. And I wanna ask when you look at where you have come to where you are now, if you could just share, like, what was a moment where you had a turning point 
if you if you look at a certain space that was the the or a or multiple turning points that put you on the path you're on what was that yeah I did have a journey and it's still continuing and I just want every woman out there every being out there to know that it is possible to have more pleasure have deeper intimacy and I came from a place where especially after I had children I felt very numb and disconnected and there was a time when I was speaking when I then finally gathered my courage to do something about it I was speaking to my relationship coach and I was telling her you know I don't feel sexual I don't have pleasure running through my body I don't um, desire my husband in the way I would like to desire him and I'm too scared to tell him the truth I'm too scared that I'm not good enough um, as a woman. I'm too scared that it's all my fault. And she was amazing and she guided me so beautifully. And still there was a part of me that felt like, okay, I just accept a life without intimacy. And I just carry on with doing yoga and meditation. Um, but that story, <laughs> that solution didn't last very long. And then I embraced that area, which was so full of uh, feeling unsafe, full of fear, full of shame. Um, and the shame mostly being the voice in my head telling me there's something wrong with me. And um, after working, after a couple of months of working with this coach, she pointed us in the direction of David Data, who is a famous um intimacy teacher he calls it the yoga of intimacy and we went to a life retreat a week-long retreat and this retreat was not about taking your clothes off and learn how to be turned on for your partner or learn certain specific techniques or anatomy mm. not at all and in that retreat, while being with women, but also with other couples, I learned that there's so much potential inside of me to feel pleasure, to feel love, um, to be connected to the wisdom of my body, to my to my intuition and how to bring that um, to my relationship, but also how to live that myself outside of any relationship. And that was actually the big aha moment that that I had and that really mm -hmm. put me on that path and it's been seven years since then and I decided mm -hmm. to have more coaching in that area I hired David Data's mentor uh, co-teacher I mean as my mentor and mm -hmm. I started to host my own women's circles I read so much about sacred intimacy I immersed myself in tantric retreats tantric teachings um, feminine embodiment work mm -hmm. and it's been a journey of um, sometimes a gentle awakening in my body and sometimes more like a more explosive awakening in my body and yeah I really went from being very numb and disconnected and scared mm -hmm. to being very attuned to the sensations in my body and feeling those in the moment and then dancing mm -hmm. the dance of intimacy rather than expecting something and then um, being disappointed that that goal hasn't been met. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. And I wanted to ask about just hearing you elaborate on this a little bit more. We'll go into, you know, what outer changes came in your life as well from this. But you mentioned right now a moment where you were kind of like, I'll just do yoga and meditate and just turn off this area. Like maybe it's just too much work. And there was a turning point and you did choose to go into it and look deeper and uncover what was there. And you named that it wasn't friendly <laughs> to use my own <laughs> terms. <laughs> Um, and I just want to ask about that moment and also name, I know I can talk a lot on these interviews too, but I, I want to name that 
the reason I host these interviews, the reason this is called just Seeds of Elegance, we're planting ideas here about things that can shape the world, is these types of new ways of being in the world, new ways of experiencing life, they're all invitations in my perspective. We don't have to take them. If you don't want to have a happier life, it's okay. <laughs> you can, if you want, keep going through life and not enjoying it. You can go onto your deathbed and uh, not have fulfilled your dreams. You can feel unhappy. And many of us, I don't think all of us want to live in that state. We just don't actually believe that there's something better. And so most of us, especially as women, are like, yeah, have not figured this out. It's too complicated and it's creating too much tension. And even looking in this door feels too dark. <laughs> and because we have the privilege of being with you who has actually been in that position, she said yes, and is seven years into the journey. Can you speak to like, what if you hadn't said yes and you just continued on the yoga meditation path or settling versus what has opened and what is, yeah, what has opened from saying yes? Hmm. There's so much goodness in what you shared, but I'm going to answer your question um, as best as I can. What, what has opened because I said yes? Um, I think I stayed small. I tried to stay safe. I was somewhat comfortable in the role of being an expat mother, um, taking mm -hmm. care of my two young children and not growing beyond that. And like you said, um, there's no need for us to become someone different or grow. We are always good mm -hmm. the way as we are. And I really, truly believe in that. And then it's a choice that we all have in which direction we want to grow and which door we want to open. Mm. And because I opened that door, I felt more empowered as a woman. I walk on this earth differently. And because mm. I can feel my power, I, I almost don't want to say power because sometimes that word has a bad vibe to it. But it's like, I invite sense. the word power. Bring it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's the sense of self, the sense of worthiness, the sense of I am love, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm carrying that through the world. That is what opened. And mm -hmm. I think I would still feel kind of helpless. I would still feel frustrated and I would still be thinking there must be something wrong with me. And instead, mm -hmm. I'm thinking, oh, my God, look at this beautiful energy, this life force that's flowing through me and what I can do with it and how I can express it in my art, in my coaching, in hosting mm -hmm. women's circles and in my parenting as well. I'm a completely mm -hmm. different person because I'm so connected to that life force energy and how it wants to move through, through me. And because I said yes to that, um, I did experience new levels of intimacy with my then husband. Now he's my ex-husband. Mm -hmm. And it also gave me the insight, the power, the courage that it took to then separate from him and understand it was actually not the intimacy that wasn't working. It was mm -hmm. um, other values that were not aligned and mm -hmm. yeah, that it gave mm -hmm. me the courage to finally step out of that marriage. Yeah. Can we go there a little bit? I want to just name that you had children. You have <laughs> children mm -hmm. and ask about the courage there. So there's one step of courage, which was actually acknowledging your unhappiness or your need or your desire for something of greater depth. And they're saying yes to that. And then when we start to say yes to those small things, we see the outer experience of life change and it looks different for everybody. You went to the retreat with the intention of working on yourself, yeah. 
and things unfolded. And I just want to ask about the courage that you, that has been a part of your path and how it has, how that courage has shaped your relationship with your children as well and your daughter. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, because I could then bring more of myself and reclaim certain aspects of my personality, reclaim certain flavors of being a human being, for example, playfulness or um, the ability to speak my truth in the moment and be fierce mm -hmm. sometimes and not shy away from that. And be more curious in a way rather than saying this is right and this is wrong so mm. I think I've softened and I became stronger at the same time I became way more playful mm. and it was that curiosity also around the parents that showed up with my children that really opened the space for more love to flow for more truth to explore and to to see the relationships evolving and especially with my daughter who is now 13 I have such a close bond and um, I I am 100% sure that a big part of why you have such a strong bond is my own awakening my own explorations the work um, that I do with women and the work that I do on myself has greatly contributed to that and she she's right now she decided to make a mother daughter wisdom handbook and a mother daughter journal to help other teenagers form closer mm. bonds with their mothers and mm. this was nothing that i had suggested to her in fact i actually needed to learn to step back and give her more space and not be like imposing my ideas or my lifestyle and my work onto her this came from her and it it almost made me cry and it made me celebrate myself so much mm. yeah mm. this makes me feel so grateful I had a moment that I like almost don't want to disclose but I'll just keep things vague where I had chosen to start doing this work and I'm newer in my own journey discovering this space of life <laughs> I voiced some things about what this about opening to sexuality as a spiritual path essentially but I didn't only disclose it in like that I was talking about the play of women and women learning how to feel comfortable in their own bodies and yeah different different details there <laughs> with someone in my life and who was a woman and she was like uh, just like wrote it off as like, well, you just Libby, like, that's why you just, you can just afford to do those things, like go on retreats and like be around women who just only care about themselves, like completely just like wrapped the whole of what I was saying is like a selfish, self-indulgent journey. And my heart was like, no, like, she's like, you know, you don't have kids. You don't really hang out with the, nie the nieces and nephews and your family. Like, which is not true, but I do have a nomadic energy and a hippie energy and I'm out and I'm clearly unconventional in many ways. And there was just like a heartbreak though of like, oh, just not wanting this work to be reduced to like something extra on the side and getting to hear from you since I had heard a little about your daughter when we had talked previously getting to hear from you about how your daughter is nurtured has been nurtured in your relationship through your own work it was just like I wish I knew more examples of it but just given that I'm new in this space and coming from a world where this is not common discourse yet I was like oh this is an example of how our own deep work as women can and will so deeply serve a younger generation and the generations are raising up and it's not like just a it's not like a flame of self-indulgence or like a fad that we're going through 
I know there's no question in there, but I just want to celebrate your own life being an, an expression of that. Yeah. Oh, thank you for celebrating me and also sharing your story um, of how you were, like, I would say almost chained for being on this path and exploring yourself and the possibilities out there and inside of you. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a beautiful thing to do. And everyone can do that in their own capacity. And it just looks different at different stages of our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My son is at home today. He was meant to be at school. He's sick. And mm. I decided I'm still going to show up here. I won't let that mm. come in the way. And then there's times mm. when I have to step back and say, no, actually, it is more important to not engage in my work right now and dedicate my time to my kids, which is one of my highest priorities to raise them in a way that uh, is in line with my values and my heart and my soul and how I want to show up as a mother. Mm beautiful the balance and the wisdom needed and speaking of that I was wondering one of another thing that you and I connected on is um I don't have a, f a word for it but essentially like the path of the of pursuing the divine feminine through tantra through philosophy spiritual philosophy and just given that you've been on the seven year journey and you have this beautiful work of art behind you that you actually created yourself, <laughs> I was just curious about your philosophy, if you have one, your spiritual philosophy, your internal embodied philosophy of, of helping, supporting women in relationships and the artistry of this, the artistry of opening to the divine mother or however you conceptualize greater the more feminine and yin components of life or if you even conceptualize it like that because you also did start hinting at some sacred rage and other emotions that we get to welcome when we pursue this path hmm. well, this is such a big question and um I often thought about how to put this into one sentence, but I don't think that's possible. <laughs> but um, I would say it starts by following your inner voices or the whispers of your heart. And those can be like desires that you have. I wish this was different, but it can also be those voices of shaming and telling you that this there's something wrong with you and this should be different and just mm -hmm. allowing yourself to accept that they are there and see this as an opening and mm -hmm. really not push your desires away and think you shouldn't have them and you should do blah 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 and you should be more accepting of yourself no those desires are really sacred and if you follow them there will be an opening and for me one of the first biggest steps was speaking my truth um, mm -hmm. and becoming vulnerable and it requires a lot of courage a lot of courage to just express what is true and dropping deeper into that truth and I see it again and again in women's circles when we or in one-on-one -on -one coaching when we express that the shame becomes less the baggage that we carry mm. becomes less we feel an awakening in our body we have the ability to then drop deeper from our head into our bodies and notice sensations notice emotions and because we have started to be vulnerable and share what's true and what's here anyway, mm -hmm. we can then start to notice other things as well, emotions that come up, sensations that come up and be present with them and not having to push them away because everything is unsafe and shouldn't be the way it is. So mm -hmm. this is, I would say, my experience of how this awakening starts, how this 
mm, this path into mm. yourself starts that's how it started with me and that's what I've been seeing in other women as well mm. how have you found pursuing this path in the midst of a culture and I know you're living in Bali now but you also have your own we carry the cultures we were raised in as well with us and work with that and then there's you know yeah there's like smaller circles of culture there's western culture you know like culture can be many things but um how how do you find pursuing this when it is countercultural to either things that you were taught or to the norms around you where you're living and and pursuing this way of being within a culture that's kind of just newly waking up to it and at times still deeply rejecting it or have you felt received where you are so bali is very open and feminine so the environment kind of shapes you gives you a certain experience and where i was growing up was in a little village in germany very stereotypical german quite <laughs> serious um hard working very efficient and with a lot of perfectionism and a lot of criticism and mm -hmm. uh, one of my teachers from the center for healing shame he said that Germans and Japanese have one of the highest amounts of shame they carry with them. Mm -hmm. And on this path, I could really feel that conditioning. And I, and shame's voice is really, there's something wrong with you and you want to hide that and you only want to be seen in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. And everything that's like ugly, you have to hide it. No one can ever find out. And that was how I was leading my life. And mm. I really had to learn how to become vulnerable and show those ugly parts. And mm. while doing that, I could really sense that conditioning in my body. And those voices from childhood came back, teachers pointing fingers um, mm. at you. And I could really feel that programming in my body. Mm -hmm. And that sense of playfulness and being mm -hmm. playful in front of other people, that was huge for me. One of my biggest fears <laughs> was dancing. And mm -hmm. that, that completely changed. There's a whole story mm -hmm. to that. And I love dancing right now. And I love being playful. And mm -hmm. every not every time, but sometimes when I allow that playful flavor to come out, there's a part of me going, is it safe? Is it okay? And that's mm. such a part of my conditioning. And the beauty of the tantric path is that in tantra, every part of you is sacred. The most ugly mm. part, the brightest part, and playfulness, and all these different kinds of flavors, they're, mm. they're, they play a big role. And one of my teachers, Sarita, in her retreats, there's always an element of playfulness. And when mm. I was allowed to play, when my inner child, my inner teenager was allowed to be playful, I was like, oh, my God, this is what I've always wanted. This is how I want to live my life. And of course, it needs discernment where you allow yourself to be playful and where it's maybe not appropriate. But just to reconnect with that part and then seeing that there was many, many people in those retreats for whom it was extremely hard to allow themselves to be playful and they would start to cry and they mm. would go into some internal pain because mm. it was maybe the first time they were invited to play. They were given a homework that was play mm. and yeah I don't know if that answers your question yeah. but um, yeah there's definitely big conditioning yeah that I can feel and there was not so much conditioning around oh my god you're doing work around sex or intimacy and I've never had a problem telling people where I'm at on my path in mm. fact 
I've always been proud that I'm exploring this path mm. and it was more about feeling the imprint that I got from the culture I was growing up in. Mm. Thank you for sharing about this cultural conditioning and the way that it comes up and the way, like even mentioning people crying at retreats in the presence of play, so powerful to like, this is just an observation. <laughs> I just want to invite your wisdom here because you've been on this road a little longer, but I mean, a lot longer. I don't understand fully yet how, why it is that when we are opened to something good, like deeply good, like exposed, not, not necessarily open, but like even exposed, like sometimes it's just being in the presence of, like I met a woman in person who it was a part of the program we, we were in who just, who's like joy was filling the room. And we have something that happens in our system where we're just like immediate grief, sadness, shut down at the exposure of the good thing. My bet, my theory, and then I'd love your take, <laughs> but it's why I tell people like, if you zoned out during these calls, you know, if you zoned out, if, if you're dissociating, which is to say like some part of you is disconnecting um, during well hearing about something that's so good it can just be that your body's not ready yet your being is not ready to receive that it feels something feels threatening about the good but it's something that just really still is blowing me away pursuing this as someone who for years was kind of on like the path of greater justice and like the counter evil <laughs> And like, I'm a designer and I'm in systems change. So I'm like, what, like, how do we change an organ and blah, blah, and like reassign the, the loops. And like, there's things in the world that <laughs> require the skill set of someone who has a mind like that. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that parts of me have gotten to do that and opening to pleasure, reopening to play. Play has always been big for me. Um, but like reopening to it on a very deep level, like inviting play in the space of spirituality has been shockingly profound in stirring emotion, which is needed for healing because healing, you have to go into the hard place. And when I first joined the program that we're in, like I, I, I created separation from play in my life at a time when I was going through like extraordinary loss because I was like, well, that was fake. Like, why was I playing? Playing sounds like playing with toys, you know? Like, why, why was I even playing? Why was I laughing before? Life is so serious. <laughs> and then, you know, had to go through, I had a moment in, in therapy or in the style of coaching that I used to be in where we were asked to remember a time in our life where we felt peace. And I was like going, I had to keep going back, 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 back. And I'm outwardly a generally um, delight, easily delighted and joyful person. And I was like, why does it feel like I have to go so far back? And it was like age 13 in acting school. And the word was like play. And I was like, oh, it's the missing ingredient. Like all my grief has sucked out. <laughs> I forgot it's play, it's play. And then we got in our program and everything was about pleasure. And I was like, I literally like made a post week one. I was like, I get that everyone's talking about pleasure here, but like relationships are really hard. <laughs> you know, like I, I need to go into the depth and like sticking with it and sticking with this pursuit of like pleasure guiding. Pleasure doesn't mean hedonism every day, all the time. It doesn't mean giving up all of the responsibilities and priorities. It means in my opinion, like awakening and allowing delight and joy and goodness but it's like profound. We have this uh, feeling that like, if I go into the good, it's going to mean that I like drop my responsibilities or like I stop caring or I won't be diligent. <laughs> and in fact, like the presence of awe, wonder, pleasure, 
goodness is so powerful that all the parts of us that like actually all the shame comes into the light that's what I just want to name that I'm still pondering about and since you've been to in shame school <laughs> do you have any wisdom on this <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. I've been in pleasure school and shame school. <laughs> what did you very, find? What did you learn? <laughs> they're very closely connected. And um, I feel that it's hard for people to be shining and seen in their goodness and their glory is because they don't feel safe to be seen in in their radiance, in their power, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and that comes from, from very early on in life. And even now with my own children, I see that my daughter sometimes tells me, or my son, when they innocently share something good about their lives or about themselves with friends, then they they often get, a, oh, stop bragging about yourself. Mm. Do you think you're better, you know? And mm. it starts very early on. And um, my healing shame teacher, Brett, very often uses this uh, definition of shame. It's just one definition out of many. Shame is the sudden interruption of pleasure. So even as a child, if you play or you touch yourself or something really innocent, somebody comes and says, don't do that. And you're like, oh, shit, I must have done some, something wrong. But actually, I was really enjoying myself. And um, so it's a scary place to be. It mm. it doesn't feel safe. And even in in the Vida style of coaching, we ask people at the beginning of the session to speak about something that they celebrate in their lives, something mm. that's going well. And what I've noticed is the more people are depressed and closed and scared um, the harder it is for them to find something to celebrate to, for them mm. to find something good in life and you really have to almost pull it out of them mm. and they have to practice this new skill of allowing space mm. for for the good things the pleasurable things the juicy things and standing in their and their beauty and their mm. magnificence. Mm. Thank you. Have you found, um, or how have you found, because you've mentioned different teachers you've had. You mentioned also having a coach at a time. And you mentioned early on about choosing to be vulnerable. And I believe like having a teacher and actually allowing them to permeate you, having a coach who's seeing you in your openness, like these things are vulnerable. How have you found this process of having teachers, having coaches, and also how did you find your own teachers and coaches? Did they appear to you? Did you seek them out? Like, what's that journey? Because I think that's still a newer process for some people who are just opening. It's still new for me, opening and seeking that. Yeah, so the first ones, they just appeared and one thing led to the other. Like my first life coach ever from... 12 years ago, who then became my relationship coach a little bit later. I found her because she also does some hands-on body work. And then later mm -hmm. she asked, she just offered me some coaching because she thought it would be helpful. And I just said, yes. And then um, found it so beneficial. And I recommended her to all my friends. And actually my friends looked at me thinking, what's happening with her? You know, we want, we want some of this too. And she was then the one pointing me to that sacred intimacy work. And then mm. I hired two coaches from the David Data experience, actually one for my relationship coach and for myself, Awakening. Mm. And one 
Uh, we actually hired as our separation coach when my mm. ex-husband and I were separating and he was guiding us through um, through a conscious separation, which is mm. beautiful. I recommend to anyone separating. Mm. And so, I don't know, the first time she just appeared or, you know, happened. And there have been times where actively where I was actively seeking someone. And mm -hmm. once I found someone on the internet by Googling and Googling, I wanted a coach for my daughter and myself. And mm. I found this beautiful woman in the US. Um, and other than that, they were recommended to me by friends or just came to me through some magical synchronicity. Mm. And I am a seeker of truth and Gentleness and safety is important for me on that path, but I'm also very courageous and I'm ready to dive in and mm. work on myself. And I've spent so much money and time on coaching, receiving coaching um, for the last 12 years. And those have been the best investments. Mm. Um, and it's just, it just accelerates the growth so much because there's only that far you can get by reading books because it's never really mm. tailored to your to your problems and also you don't have someone holding space to ask the right questions that take you deeper into those spaces inside of you mm. and Ooh. i also had some coachings uh that didn't go that well and i mm. had to part with my coach and uh, that is also part of the process and makes you grow. And I had to speak up and speak my truth, mm. even though I was like so ashamed because I thought she was, you know, um, superior to me or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So those experiences are also part of the journey mm. or can be. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. And I think it's a unique thing to have the, this, did you say 12 years? Yeah. Like 12 years of experience of that. Um, because I don't know, we're awake in general. I feel like the whole point of elegance lab and what is that I believe um, our structure of how to work with body, mind, spirit, and then all the frameworks that we have for that are all evolving. And I prefer to have a bit of a philosophical approach to it rather than, so we need, we need the science being done, but we also know that working with humans is an art and a science and a game because we live in a playful universe. <laughs> and so I want to be at the forefront of holding space for that. And for me, one of the things that I'm interested in is not just the types of coaching, the types of therapy, the types of working with the human, but also like the depth and breadth. Like, I think there's significant power of working with someone at a specific time of life. And then I also believe there's power in working with someone over time where they can actually see you grow. And then I also believe that there is like for me getting in learning about this space and getting into it, it has taught me a level of conscious relationship in a way that I had not, uh, it almost taught me how to have more conscious relationships prior to being able to do it yet in relationship that's <laughs> without a contract because you're getting emotional, you know, like there is, even though it's a coach and coachy relationship, there's also that opening and that deepening, but it's not forever. You don't need the same coach forever. You don't need the same coach for every area of your life. And I've had several experiences now over the last five years between like coaches and teachers. And like, it's been a beaut. It, I was, yeah, just what I named. I was able to start practicing witnessing a relationship as here to something as here as something to like build and grow and evolve us and be able to also say goodbye 
in a way that now has fueled relating outside of that space, but that we don't have great practices for yet socially. That's part of my own philosophy as a, as a relationship coach, but Vita, our program also talked about this relationships as space as we grow and evolve, which is still relatively countercultural to like the quality of my relationship depends on the length of time and I will stay forever. <laughs> What else would you like to share before we close around love, relationships, working with the feminine? What's present for you that you just want to impart upon people who've been listening to this discussion? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, Um, I really want women to know that it's possible for every woman to feel more pleasure in her body and use her body's wisdom in every areas of her life because that is our compass. That's our navigation system. And our intuition is one of the feminine superpowers. And every woman has access to it. And I had one client and she... She said to me after a couple of sessions, I didn't know what intuition was. Mm -hmm. People always talk about it. Use your intuition. You're a woman. You have that. And she rediscovered that and it gave her so much more confidence. It brought her joy. It gave her something to work with. And she just thought that intuition is something that's talked about out there in society, but it's not real. It's kind of like this fake yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if you're a woman and you ever doubt your intuition, your mind's intuition, your body's intuition, your heart's intuition, um, know that it is real and it's accessible for all of us and we just need to be ready to listen to it and mm -hmm. it's, it's the same with finding a coach or a teacher there's that saying um, when you're ready the teacher appears so mm -hmm. I guess you can replace that with the coach appears your intuition appears new relationships mm -hmm. appear yeah mm -hmm. Beautiful. And one thing I want to touch on before we close as well is <clears throat> you mentioned this feeling, not here, but in a prior discussion we had, and I really want to bring it back, of like feeling rewarded by life. And I want to bring this, I love, I love contrast. So I want to contrast it to another emotion. We were talking about pleasure and shame and how close they are. And on the opposite of reward is like the feeling of, you know, I'll name it how it sounds in my system and maybe you'll recognize it. <laughs> like, God, why? Why me? <laughs> it's like, oh, this is my life. This again? No, not this. I don't want this. I don't like this. It's the, it's like the, oh, the discomfort and the war and the fight. And as people inspired by Tantra, we're not here to to only classify one is good and one is bad, but I, <laughs> but we look toward the wisdom of both experiences so we can begin to make choices too from that wisdom. And I'm someone, I'm a very stubborn and rebellious soul and I'm someone who has gone very back and forth. I have a very Santa Claus relationship with God. I'm like, give me this. No, I didn't get this. I, I realize I'm throwing the word God in here, but universe source, you know, <laughs> learning how to receive the rewards that come when we are truly listening, when we are truly pursuing what is here for us. And I just wondered, it's not an easy thing to navigate. <laughs> and I would just wondered how you have experienced this, uh, this reward of life as you follow your intuition. Hmm. 
So as you said, it's not an easy journey because we want the light and we don't want all this like washing machine treatment that comes on the path <laughs> to the light of like, you know. That's a good way to put it. Being, your life being <laughs> turned upside down and, you know, you get a good rinse and you're being shaken Woo! up. Yep. Um, and that's that's not what I expected first when I uh, mm. started journeying on this path. And there's definitely still times all the time where I'm like, what? This is not what I wanted. And, mm. you know, I'm suffering again. And but I've become much better at embracing that and accepting that. And the rewards that come from going through this washing machine treatment or going through the dark um, is more love flowing in. Uh, mm much better relationships in all areas of my life whether it's with friends or my children or partners or my parents um and and sometimes with the parents it's not like a better relationship but a clearer relationship knowing how to navigate it and where to set boundaries and i just feel my life is so much richer it's so much fuller there's mm. so much more love in my life and mm. also a clearer sense of direction, a clearer sense of who I am. And I get clues from the universe, from life, through synchronicities, um, new relationships, new opportunities in life that um, I'm on this path. And yeah, those are my rewards. And I have beautiful highs where I dance with life and feel very blissful and feel very rewarded and I make sure that I'm expressing my gratitude in those moments because mm. the frequency of gratitude is very very important mm. and it's so important that we let life the universe God know that we are seeing the gifts that we are receiving and it, to me it just feels so devotional and so beautiful to express that gratitude and sometimes we need to express it for the painful moments as well because they teach mm. us so much mm. indeed washing machine moments i will now refer to them <laughs> as <laughs> i like that i love my visual analogies i'm like that's good yep if i is it, if i can come out dry at least on the other side for a little <laughs> bit and feel good and soft <laughs> <laughs> so Heike what is the best way for people to get in touch with you and what are you available for right now as a coach what can people work with you on yeah so the best way to reach me is either on Instagram or through email I have a website uh, heikekemka.com um, <laughs> it's not looking as beautiful as I would like it to look right now but never mind, that's the perfectionist in me. And I'm not as active on Instagram as I would like to be. But those are places you can reach me. And I do work in person with here, uh, with women here in Bali. But I also do a lot of one-on-one -on -one online coaching. And those mm -hmm. are usually in packages because breakthroughs can happen in one session. But usually it's a certain commitment that you need for real lasting change to happen and mm. those coaching journeys are usually like let's say a minimum of six sessions that you would have to commit to mm. beautiful thank you so much thank you for the time today and you know where to reach this goddess woman <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Libby. Mm. It was 